Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to um, get to come to Malaysia and speak with all of you and get a chance to meet people that I have never had the chance to meet and talk to before um, about these issues. And what I want to try to do today in, in this talk is to um, talk about individual privacy, talk about government secrecy, and the interplay between technology and the law and policy, and then sort of pose a broader question about what this community can do to try to improve um, both individual privacy and also government transparency. Uh, sort of a, a call to arms in some ways. So I'm going to start my story about 40 years ago, um, because I'm about 40, and that makes it really easy for me. I don't have to go back and read any history. I can just talk about what I know. And I'm going to talk about the ways that technology has changed just in my lifetime in terms of impacts on, um, on privacy and secrecy. So I grew up in a small town in New Jersey, which is on the east coast of the United States. And in a small town, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys live here in Kuala Lumpur, I wouldn't call it a small town, but you have your neighborhood and the people who know you. And neighbors are sort of friendly and people see you walking down the street. But when I grew up, if you were walking down the street, nobody saw you, or even if they did, they would just forget. Wherever you were, sort of people might be able to tell, but that was it. And um, if you weren't doing anything remarkable, then for all intents and purposes, there was no necessary remembrance. People forgot. It was no big deal. When I made a phone call, no permanent record was made. Um, maybe the phone company had some of the numbers I dialed for billing, especially if I was dialing any long distance numbers. Um, but nobody really kept track of, of that. And um, unless I was under some kind of suspicion and police officers were intentionally listening in, nobody but the other person who I was talking to had any idea what was said. The conversation was completely transitory. And when I hung up the phone, it was basically done. When I sent a letter um, to somebody, if it went through the mail, uh, I sent the letter in an envelope, and when it arrived at the recipient, the person would read it, and they'd either throw it out or whatever. And no one, none of the mail carriers, nobody at the post office, nobody had any sense or any idea of what I said in the letter. When I watched TV or listened to the radio, nobody knew what programs I watched. Um, nobody knew what stations I listened to. Nobody knew what songs I heard. It was completely transitory and totally unobserved. If I borrowed books from the library, the library might keep some track of what I read, but there was really no records of any books that I might have picked up or borrowed from a friend or purchased with cash from a bookstore or something of that nature. Nobody knew what I read, what newspapers I read, what articles I read, or for how long I looked at it. Everything that I just said is no longer true today, as you guys well know. Now, um, we have video cameras outside of buildings, inside of hotels, um, out on the street. When I walk down the street, video cameras make a record of what I'm doing. And increasingly, with technology like facial recognition and other um, ability to do searches on, uh, on video, if somebody wants to look for me a day after, a week after, a year after, depending on how long those tapes are kept, they can. So no more transitory walking down the street. If I read a book on a Kindle or on the web, there's a record made of what I've read, how long I've read it, how long I looked at each page, what pages I read. If I send that book to a friend and my friend reads it, there's a record made of who I sent the book to, of what they read, how long they looked at it. Cell phones are one of the uh, most powerful tools for surveillance today. Um, you carry your cell phone with you all the time, and it's basically a homing beacon. So when I have my cell phone in my pocket, for all the time that it's on, it's constantly pinging the nearest cell tower so that the cellular provider can route the call. Yet at the same time, those pings, either the provider makes a record or the provider can be asked to make a record, and those pings tell the provider where I am, or whoever else has access to those records, where I am. And the accuracy of that information can be very granular, depending upon how many cell towers are in the neighborhood and how much of the information is collected. So 
Now, as we move through the world with our cell phones on us, there is a track, a record that is made of all of our movements where we go, announcing our presence to whomever might care to look at that information. Um, it's also true that, uh, that providers do keep track of this information, particularly for when calls are being made. And those records providers can keep for, they can keep them for as long as they want, but they tend to keep them for a year or 18 months. And records of single tower connection to a uh, cell tower can be not as accurate as if you have multi-tower connection records, but pretty accurate. Again, depending upon the concentration of towers in your area and, uh, and um, you know, how, uh, how strong the signal strength is and that sort of thing. Also with my phone, it's a communications device. I often use it for texting and or for email. And unlike phone calls, texts and emails make a record, potentially permanent, of the contents of all the communications, all the conversations that I have with whomever I'm texting or emailing with. Um, unlike mail, which was sealed up in an envelope and was not accessible to the carrier without some sort of evidence of tampering and they weren't that interested in it, um, those emails are text searchable, uh, they can be preserved as long as the carrier wants to preserve them, and they are uh, easily searched today, a week from today, a year from today. So um, those are just examples of the way that technology has changed things so that you have inadvertent disclosures of things about yourself, your movements, your reading habits, your communications, who you communicate with. Of course, there's also the intentional disclosures that we make every day now, uh, mostly in connection with our use of social networks, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is that you like to use. Um, when you are communicating with your friends over these networks, records are being made of all of the people that you know, who you talk to, um, what you ate for lunch that day, pictures of your dog or your uh, child or that sort of thing. And um, we like to give this information up because we like to communicate with our friends and it's fun, but because we're doing it over the context of these intermediaries and, you know, because those intermediaries, the intermediaries have a business interest in collecting the information so that they can sell ads against it, um, there's just a huge amount of data that's collected about each of us individually now. So compared to when I was a child, where you go, what you listen to, what you watch, who you're friends with, all of that stuff is now searchable, observable, collectible, obtainable, either by companies or by the government or by whomever. Yes, there is encryption, um, and there are some technologies which, as I'm sure people in this room know, you can use to protect your privacy, but they don't work for a lot of these types of surveillance. And, you know, a lot of people find themselves not uh, capable of using these technologies or employ, employing them effectively. So on balance, technology has grossly altered the landscape for individual privacy from what it was like only 40 years ago. The same has been true for the government's ability to keep things secret. Um, just as with individual privacy, technology has changed the government's ability to hide things from the population. And I'm going to use just two examples and compare um, an example from when I was young, the Pentagon Papers case, with an example from, from now, which is the WikiLeaks situation. Okay. So, in the Pentagon Papers situation, uh, the United, this was in uh, late 60s, early 70s, the United States was fighting um, what Americans call the Vietnam War and what Vietnamese call the American War. And there was a guy who was a military analyst working for a big think tank. His name was Daniel Ellsberg. And Ellsberg had access to a large repository of information and documents that were about the conduct of the Vietnam War and military analysts' assessment of what was happening in the war and how well the United States was doing and all of that stuff. Um, and these documents that Ellsberg had access to told a very different story about what was happening in the war than the government was telling the American people. And Ellsberg decided that he was going to disclose this information and, and thus disclose the truth behind what was happening in the conduct of the war. 
So what did Ellsberg have to do in order to get this information? Well, the papers were approximately 7,000 pages of documents. Um, and what he needed to do was get access to a photocopier and make physical copies of these documents on a copy machine. So it was um, something like 40 or 50 binders full of documents. And Ellsberg and his friend got together and spent, I don't know how long it takes to make multiple copies of 40 or 47 different, uh, of 47 binders of documents, but they made these copies, somehow um, smuggled them out and secreted them away and held on to them for a year or two before Ellsberg took them to the New York Times. Now, the New York Times, what was the New York Times going to do with these documents? The Times is just your typical newspaper. They don't publish 47 volumes of documents, 7,000 pages. So what the Times started to do was started to um, write stories about the Vietnam War based on these documents. And um, there were a lot of efforts made, both by the, paper, by the Times, by other newspapers, including the Washington Post, and by people who were in Congress to try to make sure that the story got out. So Ellsberg gave some of these documents to um, a senator, a congressman, and the congressman entered um, about half of the pages of the documents into the congressional record. Um, he did this by trying to use uh, the law, a law about uh, the free speech and debate clause in the United States Constitution, because he uh, thought that once the documents were entered into the congressional record, there would be no way that the administration could then come and, and suppress them, because there was, a there was a constitutional provision which he could argue would prevent um, removing those documents from the public record. So the newspaper was trying to publish stories about it. The congressman was putting as many documents as he could fit into the congressional record. Um, the Washington Post started publishing stories about it as well. And um, the administration, which was the Nixon administration at the time, had a pretty quick response. They asked the Times to voluntarily cease publish publishing stories about the documents. Um, they got an injunction which is a court order from a judge saying that the paper could no longer publish those stories. Other newspapers, including the Washington Post, started to publish stories based on the same set of documents. And um, in very short order, because it was a case that involved free speech and an injunction on newspapers, the case went up to the United States Supreme Court, which is our highest court. And the court issued a ruling about whether there could be a prior restraint on speech. So um, just for those of you who are interested in speech policy and the, the law of uh, speech, in uh, the legal terms, prior restraint is something where they prevent you from talking ahead of time. And what the court um, said in a complicated legal opinion with many, different, uh, with many different opinions written by different judges, basically the gist of the case was that under United States law and the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, you have to make an extremely high showing in order to justify a prior restraint. And really, you know, if you're looking at the situation with the Pentagon Papers and the argument that the Nixon administration said, which was that this would um, undermine the United States' conduct of a war during wartime, the court said their justification was not enough. So, you know, essentially, for all intents and purposes, if that Pentagon Papers case is, fo is followed, there isn't hardly anything, really, that could legitimately justify a prior restraint on speech under United States law. That doesn't mean, um, just to clarify, uh, you know, sort of what, that, what that's about, that doesn't mean that speakers can't be punished after the fact, whether newspapers or otherwise. That doesn't mean that if you do go and publish the stories, you can't, the, the new paper can't get in trouble for any of a number of different kinds of claims afterwards, whether it be copyright infringement or uh, possession of stolen documents or uh, disclosure of trade secrets or something like that. It basically just means that you can't stop the publication ahead of time. The information is going to get out and then let the chips fall where they may afterwards, depending upon how, you know, what happened there. So it's not a get out of jail free card for the press, but it is a ruling that says speech goes forward first. Okay. So what did Ellsberg and some have to do to get this information out there? He needed a copier. He needed a hell of a lot of time. He needed a truck to carry the boxes of documents around. 
Um, he needed a newspaper that was willing to put its neck on the line and do the publication. You know, the Times had gotten some advice from, uh, you know, beforehand, before they did the publication, that maybe they shouldn't. So they needed a paper that was willing to put the data out there. Um, and then, you know, a whole heck of a lot of lawyers after the fact. Okay. Let's compare the situation with WikiLeaks. In WikiLeaks, the recent case involving uh, uh, American Diplomatic uh, Cables and Bradley Manning. Bradley Manning was a young guy in the Army. He, uh, because of where he was stationed, had access to the switch through which confidential data was sent um, by the United States military. And from his access to the switch, he basically just downloaded um, which something which I think is the equivalent of a quarter of a million diplomatic cables from the United States. Downloaded them, put them on a CD or a thumb drive, went to the United States on vacation or when he was on shore leave, um, gave that information to, um, basically gave that information to the, to the WikiLeaks site, and WikiLeaks is able to publish that data in full on the web without any kind of like, they are editorializing, but it's not necessary. And now we can go online and look at that repository of cables, and we can read it. We can search it. We can, you know, we can do text searches. We can look at it, and we can um, read them for ourselves. So, how, I mean, how, so think about the difference. Ellsberg was a really high up guy in uh, the analyst community. Bradley Manning was a 23 year old soldier in the Army. Um, Ellsberg had to have access to um, a copier that he could use in private. Manning just hooked into the confidential, into the switch through which classified information was sent. M Ellsberg needed to have a whole lot of paper and a truck and a bunch of boxes and a bunch of binders. Bradley Manning needed a thumb drive or a CD. Ellsberg needed a newspaper that was going to stick its neck out and publish the documents. And the newspaper had to have a reporter who was going to read through the documents and come up with a story and, and publish stories based on the documents. Manning can give the documents to Assange or find a server and put every single one up in full and full text searchable. This could not have happened back in 1969 when Ellsberg was acting. Now, because of the internet and because of digital technology, we can have access to terabytes of data, full text searchable, completely publishable, with little to no, easy to, easy to copy, easy to transmit, easy to read, easy to search, with little or no cost. So, what, uh, you know, just sort of just some commentary on what this means and what the WikiLeaks situation shows about the way that things have changed for government secrecy is, um, and this is a quote from Stephen Aftergood, who's at the Project on Government Secrecy at the Federation of American Scientists. He said, this example, the example of WikiLeaks, illustrates the extraordinary asymmetric power that a leaker can have, especially when aided by an outfit like WikiLeaks. But of course, not necessarily. Okay. So um, I don't mean necessarily in what I'm saying here to be taking sides and to say that things were better in the Pentagon Papers day or better in the WikiLeaks day. What I mean to say is that because of technology, certain constraints um, on both privacy and government secrecy have been dissolved. And so now we are in a completely different world where things are not like they were just a short time ago. Um, let me give you some other examples about how um, technology has posed the similar kind of challenge to corporate secrecy. Okay, so um, I talked a little bit before about handset, um, your, your handset and how it shows your location. So one of the things that we fought about a lot when I was at the Electronic Frontier Foundation is uh, government access to that handset location data um, at, through, you know, through the provider. And one of the things that we don't know um, is how often governments go and collect that data and use it to figure out where people are. We're very interested in how, in, in, you know, how often that happens and what's done. So um, there was a uh, guy who was a security researcher and a doctoral student at the University of Indiana named Chris Segoyan. 
And Segoyan was um, hired by the Federal Trade Commission, which is a, an agency in the United States government, to do privacy and security research um, as like, a, you know, for them, uh, basically to deal with issues involving spam, spyware, and those sorts of things. They recognized that they needed somebody with a technical background, and they picked Chris. Um, Chris had gained some notoriety when he was still a student um, by basically uh, a, a sort of interesting prank that I represented him following. He, uh, the, you know, you guys fly, so you know that uh, you need a boarding pass. And uh, they check your boarding pass and your ID when you come into the airport. And so people had said that the boarding passes, when you can print them electronically on the computer, are editable. And so it's not a legit, it's not a real um, legitimate evidence that you have a ticket and that you're going to fly that day. So using it as a security measure is kind of dumb. And a number of people had said that, but nobody really paid much attention to it. So while he was a graduate student, what Chris did is he set up on his web page an automatic boarding pass generator, which gave you basically a you know, template of a boarding pass and allowed people to just type in whatever their name was, and then you could print the boarding pass out, being like a sort of actual demonstration of the principle that everybody knew, which is that the boarding pass is not evidence of anything. Anybody can just, can just create it. And he put it up on his website, and there was a lot of outcry. In fact, some um, members of the United States Congress Chris called for Chris to be prosecuted for, uh, you know, for, for this prank. Um, but it did call attention to the problem. I don't think anything ended up changing. Um, and Chris was investigated by the Transportation Safety Agency um, as a result of this. And I represented him in that, in that uh, investigation. And he ended up, nothing happened to him. But this gives you a little bit of an idea of you know, where Chris was at and the kind of person that he is. Um, and so here he was at the FTC. And as part of his FTC uh, job, he got invited to a conference in Washington, D.C., which is the Intelligent Support Systems Conference, or ISS. And ISS is the yearly conference. They do it all around the world, not just in D.C., for uh, criminal investigations, intelligence gathering, and lawful intercept. Lawful intercept is what, um, is what the government calls surveillance technology. So the conference is invite only, and Chris got invited because he was uh, working at this government agency. And so he signed up for the conference, and his employers knew that he was going. Um, you needed to show proof that you were a government employee, so he showed his FTC identification badge, and he got into the conference. And he went to a session that was about location tracking via cell phone handsets. And uh, at that session, there was an employee from Sprint, which is a major carrier. And the Sprint employee told the audience, an audience of about 50 people, that Sprint had set up an automated website that law enforcement could use to get location data about Sprint customers. And that in the 13 months that the Sprint website had been set up, there had been 8 million pings for that kind of customer data. So there's some debate about what a ping means, whether that it's not 8 million people um, and how often a ping is. Like if you're tracking somebody's location in real time, how many pings do you need in order to track them over how much of a period of time? But this was really news for people because nobody had any other kind of data about how often law enforcement accesses cell phone data for location tracking. Chris um, made a tape recording of the session, so he had the Sprint guy on tape, and after the uh, conference was over, he wrote on his blog that this is what the Sprint guy said, and he posted the audio, lest anybody say that's, you know, that's not what the Sprint guy had said, and there was a big hue and cry over it. Um, and then Sprint and, um, you know, sort of scrambled to uh, to qualify the 8 million number and to sort of raise questions about what that really meant in terms of tracking and that sort of thing. While I think, you know, a lot of people were kind of aghast that there were 8 million pings just from Sprint just in a 13-month period. Um, you know, there was a lot, it raised a lot of awareness about the ubiquity of the practice just with even this one carrier just over this period of time and the fact that the access was automated, meaning that there wasn't any kind of check and balance going on by the company where the company was making sure that what the law enforcement agents were doing was either authorized by court order or somehow justified by the um, investigation that what they were doing or something like that. So 
What happened after that was um, Chris got fired from his job at FTC, uh, not for making the recording, that was legal, not for disclosing the information, that was free speech. He got fired uh, allegedly because he used his FTC badge to get into the conference as ID to, to get into the conference, even though he was invited, even though his employer knew that he was going. So he lost his job there after just a year of being at the FTC. Um, another example of corporate privacy is a, another case that I worked on involving uh, electronic voting machines. And this was a company called Diebold, which makes electronic uh, voting machines so people can e-vote. And in this case, somebody, an unknown person, got hold of an archive of internal emails that the company's uh, technicians had about their efforts to deploy these electronic voting machines out in the field. And the uh, emails, uh, the email repositories showed some unbelievable, and it would be funny if it didn't have to do with like the very, you know, essence of democracy, which is voting, some very shocking problems with these voting machines, including coming up with negative tallies, like how could Al Gore get negative 1,200 votes in a particular district. And um, the people who got hold of these emails leaked them, and then multiple groups, including some anti-war groups and some anti-electronic voting groups, published the repository of emails online. And people could search through the emails. You could find your district if you knew, knew your district number and see whether there had been any problems with e-voting machines reported in your particular district. So how did Diebold respond to this? Did they fix the voting machines? Did they apologize? Did they explain the situation? No. They um, issued cease and desist letters threatening the people who had posted these repositories of emails with copyright infringement, claiming that the emails their employees wrote were copyright infringing and therefore um, you know, they, people had to take them down or risk liability under copyright law. So, what the EFF did, and when I was at Stanford, I worked on this case too, was to uh, turn around and sue Diebold and say that the copyright claim was, um, was basically didn't have uh, basis in law and that the reason why Diebold was doing this was to suppress information about the quality of their e-voting machine product and um, that was not a legitimate copyright reason to issue takedowns. Uh, and we won that case and got a first ever ruling uh, that said that, um, you know, you can't use provisions of United States law that provide for notice and takedown for copyright infringement in order to suppress speech like this um, where there's no real copyright interest that's at stake. It's just a speech suppressing interest. So, excuse me, I'm going to look at what, how much time I have left. So you'll see, because I'm going to tell a few more uh, stories about this, that copyright law is a great tool for people who want to suppress speech. Super useful. Okay. So um, let me give another example. So my other example is a case that I, uh, you know, we talked uh, in, my, um, when, in my introduction about some of the, the computer hackers that I've represented. Um, in 2005, at the Black Hat Conference, I represented a guy named Michael Lynn, and this is another example of how copyright law was used to try to suppress information coming out about a company and a company's faulty products. So does anybody here know the, the story with Mike? A few, pe few people, you guys do. So, um, sorry. So basically, you know, this is another example of uh, how difficult it is for companies to suppress information about, um, about their products. Um, and, and also a story about how using the law to try to suppress that information sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. So um, Michael worked for a company called ISS, different ISS from the surveillance conference. And as part of his job there, he was um, working on the security of Cisco routers, basic technology that runs the internet. And he discovered vulnerabilities in the routers which were previously unknown and potentially very serious. Uh, Cisco, which worked with his company, put pressure on his employer to have Mike pull the talk that had been accepted at the Black Hat conference. And the employer agreed and told Michael that he couldn't give the talk and told him he had to give a talk about something else. So Mike got up on the stage, quit his job, and gave the original talk that he had planned to give about the Cisco routers from the very beginning. 
And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was very exciting until just a few hours later when he got a lawsuit served on him, uh, a lawsuit filed by both Cisco and by his employer claiming that he was liable for copyright infringement. So um, the copyright case was based on the idea that uh, Mike's employer owned copyright in the PowerPoint slides that he had used during his talk. Um, and uh, that Cisco owned copyright in the decompiled code that Mike had used to do the research that he had done. There was also a trade secret claim where Cisco claimed that the fact that the routers were insecure was a trade secret, and by disclosing that trade secret, Mike had violated the trade secret law. So again, in this case, we see the talk had already happened, um, but now we have this lawsuit, and um, we were in this sort of marathon session the whole rest of that weekend trying to dispose, dispose of the lawsuit. Um, you know, clear, you know, one of the things about trade secret law is that trade secrets are um, protected if they are um, something that the company derives value from the fact that the thing is secret. And so we had basically two interesting arguments about that. The first one was, the fact that your product doesn't work, if people don't know that, yeah, the product's more valuable, but that's not the kind of secret that trade secret law is meant to protect, you know, the knowledge that the product actually sucks. And then the second thing was that, you know, when you do reverse engineering and you find out from a product that's just, you know, generally on the market, when you do that research and you find out that the product doesn't work, um, that's not a misappropriation. It's a legitimate discovery of that information, and the trade secret law doesn't control or regulate legitimate discoveries of that nature. So what ended up happening in that case was we were able to settle the lawsuit after a couple of days. It was pretty stressful. Um, but subsequently, Cisco had an ISS, his employer, got the FBI involved, which is the federal law enforcement agency for the United States, and the FBI investigated Mike for a couple of months thereafter before eventually closing the investigation without any further action. So it's pretty stressful, um, but as a result, we know a lot more about routers and router security, and there was a lot of great research that built on the stuff that Mike had done um, you know, at other conferences later that year and the next year, and you know, route, we know a lot more about how to make routers secure now than we did. So you can kind of start to see here the problem of how the law is being asked to come in and protect the secrecy of things that now people are able to discover and disclose. So, you know, with Mike, the slides were out, people passed them around, Cisco and ISS could not control the PowerPoint slides. Once they were published, they were just, you know, out on the internet. Um, so, you know, we, there's been a number of cases that I've been involved in where, um, you know, there's been efforts on both sides to try to, with using the law, to try to protect individual privacy or protect government secrecy or protect corporate secrecy, and the law is, uh, you know, sort of a it's, a, it's a little bit of a mess. So I'll give just a couple examples. So in the privacy world, um, when I was at EFF, we did a lot of work on uh, location privacy and cell phones. And I mean, I, I'm not going to get into the legal details of what that looked like because it's not relevant for a lot of people here. But what I'll say just sort of generally is um, there's a statute that Congress passed in 1986 called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. And all of the stuff that we try to protect in terms of your individual privacy, your emails, your text messages, your physical location, all of that stuff, we have to look to this statute that was passed in 1986 and try to argue that there's some kind of protection under there. Um, because if that doesn't work, then all we have uh, in the United States to fall back on is the Fourth Amendment for the, of the Constitution. Fourth Amendment only applies to law enforcement actors and only for a certain set of things that are the type of things that individuals might want to keep private. So, um, you know, in terms of cell phone data and real-time pings and the ability of law enforcement to get access to that, we have, you know, 25-page briefs arguing that this complicated interplay between various sections of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act as amended by, um, a, you know, another law mean that government can't track you in real time without first going to get a, a warrant. And 
just a little bit about you know what that means there's a number of ways obviously that law enforcement can go and get your information one is they could just ask the company for it and the company can just voluntarily turn it over they could also just go to the company and take the information if they want they could subpoena in other words issue a court order to you and ask you for the information and at that point you know that you're being investigated and you could go to a court and ask the court to say the subpoena is inappropriate for some reason um, or they can we can you know, interpose the, uh, a judge as kind of a gatekeeper there between law enforcement and the, com and, the, and the data and ask the courts to sort of police that relationship. And when the courts police that relationship, um, basically, you know, there's a lot of different uh, standards you can ask the court to have to find before they issue an order saying it's okay for law enforcement to get access to this data. So um, there's lesser standards where it's like there's a, you know, it's relevant to an investigation. There's a, you know, all the way up to, to probable cause, which is that, you know, you, it's probable that the information is going to show evidence of a crime. And um, when, we, when we talk, when I talk about a warrant under United States law, that's the probable cause standard where a judge looks at the facts that a law enforcement officer presents to her and says, I see here that there's a real investigation going on, that the stuff they're looking for is a legitimate part of this investigation. The facts show to me that it's probable that if we give over this information, it's going to be evidence of the wrongdoing that they're investigating, as opposed to sort of a hunch or kind of like a, an inkling or just sort of like some looking, looking around or that kind of thing. So in order to have it be some kind of privacy protection where they're doing this kind of, you know, not in your presence seizure of information or going to, to the provider, we want the court to play some kind of gatekeeper role. Otherwise, it can just be a total fishing expedition. So we were able to use these, compli you know, this complicated statutory argument to argue that they need a warrant for um, real time following you with your cell phone, just you know, sort of with their automated Sprint website. Um, and we've used the same, uh, you know, sort of an another set of complicated arguments to argue that for historical data, in other words, the data that the provider stores in order to do your billing, that if the court wants to because we didn't have an argument that they have to, but if the court wants to, then the court again can ask for a warrant. And what the government had argued is the court has no right to ask us for a warrant. They have no right to ask us for any proof. All we have to do to, to the court is just tell them, um, you know, this information is relevant to an investigation that we're conducting. conducting. So why are these statutory arguments that we made so important and why did we try so hard to interpose this kind of statutory limitation um, for, to protect the privacy of people as they move through their lives? Well, it's because the Fourth Amendment doesn't do that work, really. And the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution says that um, if you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in something, uh, as a general rule, in order to invade that expectation of privacy, government needs to go get a warrant. And there's tons of exceptions to that rule, but that's kind of the general rule. So think about your location as you move through the world. Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your movements? And um, who thinks you do have a reasonable expectation of your privacy in your movements as you walk around on the public street? Nobody. Okay. Well, you guys are going to get. You guys are going to. Um, you guys have a lot of Supreme Court justices who are going to agree with you. Um, in the 1970s, there were some cases about this that involved beepers and just a little beeper that you stick on the uh, bumper of a suspect's car, and it's kind of like a. You know, do you ever play that game? Like you're getting colder, you're getting hotter, sort of game. It's like if the beeper got louder, if you were close to the car or the, in this case, canister of uh, chemicals that you were tracking, and it got quieter as you got farther away, and it helps the police officers kind of track the, um, you know, not lose the cars that they were searching for. And what the beeper cases said was, as long as the thing you're tracking is out on the public street, there's no reasonable expectation of privacy, so the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. Once the beeper gets into a private place, like a house or a garage or something like that, at that point you need to get a warrant because it's telling you something about the interior of a, of a private protected space. Okay. So compare that. That was when I was, that was, when I was a, a kid back in the early 70s. Compare that with what we have now um, with cell phones and with GPS. Not just GPS in your phones, but GPS devices that 
law enforcement can put on your car. They also have it where you can do like a little blow dart. So if you're, you know, in a high speed chase or something like that, you can kind of just shoot the GPS dart and it sticks to the side of the car and then you can just go back to your police officer station and sort of sit there and watch where the bad guys go. So there's, is GPS like these beeper cases. And the United States government has argued it's the, basically the same thing, same rules apply. You don't have any kind of privacy on the public streets, so there's no Fourth Amendment regulation of it. And there's been a whole bunch of debate over this in the lower courts. And some of the courts have agreed with the government and applied the beeper cases, and a few courts have not. A few courts have said the accuracy, the 24-7 kind of surveillance that GPS enables, the um, specificity of that, and the fact that they could do that kind of surveillance not just on one person, not just on 100 people, but on everybody if they wanted to, that it's cheap enough that they could do it on everybody, makes it a kind of surveillance technique that's different in quality and different in kind than what was technologically enabled and what was approved by the Supreme Court back in the 1970s. And there's a Supreme Court case now um, that we wrote a brief in when it was in the lower court while I was at EFF. The case is called United States versus Jones, and the Supreme Court's going to decide this. So after this term um, in the United States, either we're all going to be subject to warrantless GPS tracking, or there's going to be some requirement that courts say, you know, you've got a reason to do this. There's some cause to track these people before you go ahead and do it. Um, what kinds of legal principles have governments brought to bear in order to try to um, deal with the challenge technologies provided to, to technologies posed to government secrecy. Um, there's a couple of uh, tools they've used legally, but there's two main ones, the state secrets doctrine and, um, uh, and using national security espionage, uh, the Espionage Act for national security prosecutions. Um, the state secrets doctrine uh, is, uh, was, I mean, one of the earliest state secrets cases was back in the 1950s. It involved a spy plane that was shot down. This plane had some military people on it and some civilians. And the surviving families of the, civili of the civilians sued the United States government um, for wrongful death for, their, pe for the, their family members having been killed on this plane. And the government was able to kill the civil suit and not have to pay any damages or anything like that um, by invoking the state secrets doctrine. And they said, because this was a, a spy plane, we can't litigate this case at all. There's nothing we can say about this case that won't reveal United States secrets. So children, widows, you guys are out of luck. The, the case is over. And the court agreed with that. This is the case of United States versus Reynolds. Now, that was back in the 50s, and since then, those documents have been declassified. So you can go and look at what the documents were that the government had argued prohibited the widows from any kind of lawsuit for recovery um, and see what the report is. And when you look at the report, it basically says that um, there was secret equipment on the plane, but it doesn't give any kind of details or information about what that secret equipment was. And people already knew that there was secret equipment on the plane. That had already been published in the press. So, you know, sort of in retrospect, looking back at this case with the benefit of all of the information, there was no state secret that actually should have prohibited the surviving family members of these people who had been killed from litigating their case and seeing whether, in fact, uh, the United States should have been liable for wrongful death in that case. Um, so that's our sort of a historical lesson about it. Yet, the invocation of state secret privilege by the United States government has only increased in recent years. Uh, the United States has used that argument to uh, basically dispose of, without any kind of additional fact-finding or any sort of uh, revelation about government activity, in a couple of cases involving extraordinary rendition, which is the term for kidnapping people, exporting them to other countries, and having them be tortured there. And there were some lawsuits brought by um, a couple of individuals against the United States government for that practice, and the government was able to um, basically kill those lawsuits without allowing any kind of discovery or further disclosure of information about that practice using the state secrets doctrine. Um, the government also tried to use the state secrets doctrine to kill a lawsuit that the EFF uh, pursued, started before I was there and pursued while I was there uh, against the uh, against AT&T, the telecommunications carrier. 
And in that case, uh, basically, a whistleblower disclosed that AT&T was allowing government access to the switches so that the United States government could surveil communications, telephony and in internet communications, without a warrant in violation of United States law. And the government, uh, the EFF in very intelligently sued AT&T, but not the government in the first round of cases. And the government intervened in that case and raised the state secrets doctrine and said that this is, a, you know, said basically it's a secret um, who we surveil, what we're doing there. And the court initially rejected the state secrets doctrine, which was kind of amazing considering all the other cases that had been, um, that had been disposed of based on that argument. But subsequently, Congress passed a law that had the retroactive effect of killing that lawsuit, and the court eventually did dismiss it, and, you know, and, and uh, full discovery did not go forward, and there wasn't further information about that that came out. So state secrets doctrine, retroactive statutes, these are the kinds of things that, uh, that my government's been able to use in order to try to maintain government secrecy against the pressure by um, individuals and by activists and by civil libertarians to find out what exactly the government's been up to in prosecuting, for example, the war on terror and doing surveillance against people and taking advantage of technology. I mentioned, and I'll just briefly mention, that there's also been more national security prosecutions under the Espionage Act under the Obama administration than ever before in United States history. What other legal tools are there to try to protect privacy? That's government privacy. What about individual privacy? Well, um, I'll just talk a little tiny bit about class action privacy uh, lawsuits, which is also something that I've been involved in. You know, one of the things that we have as a tool for individuals is the ability to sue somebody who causes you some kind of harm. And there's been um, one of the major barriers to using civil liability to encourage uh, basically uh, companies to do better with privacy is that it's been very difficult under United States law to make a claim that there is a legally actionable harm that people suffer as a result of having their private information be disclosed. So in a number of lawsuits they've said yes, you know, your private information's out there, maybe it's embarrassing, maybe it's not, but what, what harm is it to you? If you're embarrassed or something that's just not the kind of damage that um, we recognize as being something that can be the basis for civil liability. Um, so given that, what we've seen is sort of this kind of uh, profligation of class action lawsuits under various different privacy statutes that have been passed. But again, um, these class action lawsuits have not done a great job in protecting user privacy for a variety of reasons. One is that the um, companies put stuff in their terms of service that give you people notice of all the stuff that they're going to do and so there's not great claims under that. So where we have seen claims, they've been for these really borderline things that don't necessarily have too much direct play with people's individual experience of trying to keep their information to themselves and to their friends and not, not shared more publicly. Um, for example, I'm involved now in a lawsuit um, where I represent the company it's a lawsuit against Pandora Music. Do, do you guys have that? You couldn't have that service here, but it's basically an online music uh, company where you can say you like a certain kind of music and then they play you other songs. And uh, there's a lawsuit under like a Michigan statute saying that Pandora disclosed too much information about what music people were listening to to anybody who knew the user's email address. I represented Yahoo in a lawsuit where they claimed that Yahoo's California office should not be accepting um, search warrants and subpoenas that were issued by a court in a different state, even though the court issued uh, warrant or subpoena was valid. And these cases got dismissed, but um, you know, sort of you, when they last, like the lawsuits that have been filed against, let's say, uh, Facebook or Apple for various kinds of privacy disclosures. They roil on for years and years and years, and you know, sort of in the end, 
the practices of the companies are sort of the same, and it's this you know, very sort of expensive thing where uh, the lawyers kind of get rich, but in terms of what the user's experience is, there's really no uptick in any kind of benefit for the user's privacy-wise. So, uh, that, I mean, that's my opinion, but I think that's, uh, this, is, this is a very, to the extent that class action lawsuits could be used to encourage better corporate behavior, it's a very dull, very blunt tool, uh, if it works at all. So, um, just to be sort of explicit about what I mean by works, and maybe this has come clear, um, for me personally, what I think works is something that protects individual privacy, but yet allows people to know what the government is up to with some sort of carve-outs for the types of things that maybe need to be kept confidential in order to protect people's lives and stuff, but basically that, that people should know what their government is up to and that we should have some ability to um, therefore, thereby act on that, uh, on that information and understand better or to, to, uh, to control better what it is our government does in our name. So, I, you know, in sum, I like individual privacy, and I don't like government secrecy, except in some very, very narrow categories. But it's a complicated balance, even as I say it, and so we shouldn't be that surprised that the law doesn't do that great a job of getting it right, particularly when you consider the pressure of technology, how new the technology is, and how slow the legal system is to react to those kinds of changes. So, what role can hackers play, what role can activists play in this privacy, security, secrecy debate? So back to the example of WikiLeaks. In the investigation of WikiLeaks and, who, uh, and how information got revealed to WikiLeaks uh, via Bradley Manning, uh, the government issued secret orders and has continued to issue secret orders to providers for information about people who worked on the WikiLeaks pro project. And so a couple of months ago, um, the government issued orders, secret orders that were not allowed, the, the fact of which were not allowed to be disclosed to Twitter. And what Twitter did was Twitter turned around and um, demanded to be allowed to reveal to the users who were the subject of the investigation that these orders had issued and thereby let the users battle out in public in the court system whether these orders were properly issued or not. Um, and Twitter won that argument and um, there's an ongoing court case now uh, that you can go and look at about what the orders were for and who they were about and what the course of the government investigation is in, in uh, regards to Manning and the WikiLeaks uh, investigation. There was also um, the anonymous attacks on PayPal, for example. So PayPal, which is a you know online uh, online transfer of money service, uh, along with many other companies under pressure from the United States government, decided that they didn't want to that they were no longer going to route money in the form of donations or whatever to WikiLeaks. And in retaliation, people calling themselves anonymous decided to do a DDoS attack on PayPal and bring the service down. Um, and they were able to do that. Uh, I'm sure that many, many, many people who participated in that attack are um, never going to be found. But there were a number of people who were found, and there's about is it 15 or 20 prosecutions in the United States now of people who were not crafty enough to hide their tracks, and the FBI was able to find them uh, being prosecuted for their participation in the PayPal DDoS attack. So and think about if your goal is government transparency, and if your goal is to figure out um, what the government's up to, either because you support WikiLeaks and you want to know or because you want to know how the government conducts investigations and who they're looking at and what their justification is for certain kinds of justifications. My question is, who did better in this? Did Twitter do better in terms of government transparency or did Anonymous do better in terms of government transparency? And Twitter's uh, standing up to the government and asking for this disclosure told us more about what the government was up to than bringing down the PayPal service for a little while ever did. Let me give you just leave you with just one other example of what I think is a really creative way to use both technology and the law um, in order to shed more light on uh, on what the government's up to. So, this uh, 
is the story of Eric Rockner. He uh, was arrested in Seattle a couple of years ago for playing urban golf. So do you guys know what urban golf is? Basically, uh, you get a bunch of foam uh, golf balls or real golf balls, and you have a golf, uh, you know, you, and you basically go golfing around in a sort of uh, mixture of a treasure hunt, drunken, like, sort of tour of the city. And Eric was involved in this little game, and he got contacted by police officers, and they didn't like what he was doing, and uh, he had a bad attitude. I think the officer said he had a brainiac attitude, and so he got arrested, and they uh, decided to charge him criminally. So Eric fought the case against him, and as part of the evidence in the case against him, he knew that police cars have uh, front-mounted video cameras where often they take video footage of officer encounters with individuals. And he, as part of defending himself in the case, asked for disclosure of that video footage so he could use it to defend himself, um, I guess to show that ha being a brainiac is not actually a, a crime and, and shouldn't be the kind of thing that results in the difference between getting arrested and not, in get not getting arrested. And there was a kind of complicated back and forth where the police officer, where the, the law enforcement agency either didn't disclose all of the video or held it back at first. They got some of it. They didn't get all of it. Um, but eventually, he got the criminal case against him dismissed. Um, and then he turned around and he sued the law enforcement agency and said, you know, you, it was a false arrest. You didn't disclose all the video information to me. And as part of that lawsuit, he asked for discovery of what all the logs were from their different uh, recording of their interactions with suspects. And he received that information in discovery in his lawsuit um, for, the, for, the, uh, wrongful, for their wrongful uh, arrest. Then he turned around and he's put all of that information, the logs of who was recorded when, um, not who was recorded, but when video uh, surveillance was taken but with police encounters and individuals, he put that up online on his web page. So if you had an encounter with this particular police agency, you can go online now and look and see whether you were videotaped. And in your criminal case, they failed to turn over this information about you, which could help uh, you in your defense and could help clear you of charges if the officers you know, basically arrested you for a, a false reason the same way that they arrested Eric. So you know, and I look at um, the examples of people like Chris Segoyan or like Eric or Twitter um, and the way that people have been able to creatively use a combination of technology and the law in order to uh, either protect themselves or protect their own privacy to shed light on the way that the government uses technology to surveil us or to uh, disclose information about the way that the government works or about the way that, or about corporate products or that sort of thing that is the kind of thing that people want to know so that they can keep themselves safe and keep themselves secure. Uh, to me, that's the essence of the, the, the hacker ethic and the essence of being uh, truly innovative about pursuing, uh, pursuing freedom and pursuing privacy and pursuing uh, security uh, using both uh, the law and technology. So that's what I wanted to say to you guys today. Thank you very much. I don't know if I have time for questions, but if I do, I will take them. Yes, do I? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. OK. Uh, any questions from the floor? We have coffee break after this, so feel free to okay. approach Jennifer directly. Yeah, I'll be around. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you.